Welcome to the Real View podcast, where Ohio realtors connect you to innovators and influencers, keeping you with the real view of real estate. Whether you're a broker, agent, first time home buyer, industry leader, or just happen to stumble upon our podcast today, you can expect to hear tips, tools, tricks, interesting information, and so much more from the experts in Ohio's real estate game. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's episode of The Real View Podcast. I'm your host, Allison Wiley. Joining me today is Carrie Arblaster, my co-host, and our special guest, Dave Browning. Thank you both for being here with me today. Dave is a commercial realtor practitioner, a past president of the Cleveland area of realtors and involved in numerous other things. And he's going to be able to tell you all that way better than I can. So thank you both for being here with me today. I'm really happy that you're here. Well, thanks for having me. It's just great, uh, great to be part of this. Dave, as you know, we kind of prepped you for this, and I'm sure you are an avid listener of the Real View podcast, so you know what question is coming up. We like to ask all of our guests, what is the best view that you have ever seen? So what is it? <laughs> well, for me, it, it kind of, uh, I think it's a great question and one that really brings it out. Um, my wife and I, in recent years, our life has been all about the view. And so really there's three aspects of it, but uh, there's a theme here. And, you know, for us, my wife and I were originally cheeseheads from Wisconsin, but we've raised four kids um, in Ohio for the past uh, 34 years. But it came time for us to make an investment. And so my wife and I bought a house in Wisconsin in a place that's called the Door County Peninsula. And this place that we bought and renovated is all about the view. Because if you know where Door County is, there's a a geologic feature called the Niagara Escarpment, which is a rock formation around the Great Lakes. But in this situation, there's a peninsula that juts out into Lake Michigan. And so our house is right on the Bay of Green Bay and looking at the, the prime west view. And literally when you're on in this house and in the kitchen, you feel like you're on a ship because you're looking at the water. And then you've got the the sunsets. So for us, the view has always been about the water, the view over the Bay of Green Bay. But then it's all about our family and friends that this is such a cool place that they all come. So it's really allowed us to connect in. And so that's a, a huge one for us. But then I'd also offer that in Cleveland, after raising our kids and the nest was empty, Mary and I decided, you know what? We love the view in Wisconsin. Now we want to do it in Cleveland. So we had a house and a golf course in suburban Cleveland that was awesome. But we decided, you know what? Let's go downtown. So now our view, we're eight stories up, glass, looking out over the mouth of the Cuyahoga River and, you know, the park and the sunsets and all that. And yet we're not done yet because our our next view, we're about to leave this place in the spring because it's an apartment. And we're moving down to a trendy neighborhood in Cleveland called Tremont. And friends of mine are building this apartment building. We signed the first lease. And so we're going to end up with this balcony with this view of the, the skyline of Cleveland and Quicken Loans Arena, Progressive Field and the whole skyline. So oh, my us, gosh. It's this all about is the fantastic. View. Can you like plan my next couple moves? <laughs> we're going to need, uh, yeah. when we release this episode, we're going to need pictures of, we'll uh, the, the all, of, of these views. Yeah. yeah. Cause I, I'm dying to see, I'm a sucker for like nice views and city views, especially too. So I can only imagine how awesome that is. That is You've awesome. got it. I, you know, the third view is a little trickier cause it's, it's under construction. Yeah. And we're moving in in May, but I do have a view of that one too. So I'll, I'll share this. Yeah, please do. That'll be great. We'll put it up so everyone can see it. This, I, I feel like it. this was like the perfect question to ask you because like you're, you <laughs> yeah. seem like a big views person. <laughs> yes, it, 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 it's funny. Our, our life, it, it really became all about the views in this phase of it. That's awesome. Very good. Well, I didn't know you were a cheesehead. That's good to know too. Wisconsin is on my bucket list. I've not been there, but I hear people rave about it. It's beautiful, outdoorsy. Madison is a lot of fun. So maybe when I get to go, I'll, I'll ask you where I should go. Oh, yeah. I can give you a great tour. And, you know, I'm a Great Lakes person. Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, they're all great Midwestern cities, similar to Milwaukee, where I grew up. Yeah. 
Well, like Allison said, Dave, you have been engaged and involved in the Realtor Association, both at the state and local level for years. Um, you also were or still are the CBRE market leader. Are you still in that position? There, there's a story behind that. Yeah, I want to hear everything. Bring us back to, you know, the beginning of time when you said, yeah, I think I want to get involved in real estate. Talk about your move to Ohio. Yeah, tell us everything. Okay, well, I, I could do that. And, you know, because one of the questions that you threw out at me is, okay, how'd you get involved in real estate? I, I think that is, it's always a fascinating question because how people get into our industry is just so interesting. And whether it's my employees or, you know, friends over the years. And my story is, you know, just like everyone else. My earliest memory, I, I was probably five or six years old. And I have a memory of my grandfather. I was literally driving around with him in a car as he was collecting rents and kind of meeting his tenants and looking at his properties. And so that got my attention a little bit. But then, you know, and I was an entrepreneur and, you know, age 12, 13, started cutting lawns. Next thing you know, I'm painting houses. Next thing you know, I'm spray painting barns and warehouses and actually had a, a company that I was running with some friends of mine. And I'm a junior in college. And I all of a sudden realized that I'm in a finance class and a professor that I really respected said, and I was looking for something to put on my resume. I'm going, ah, I'm, I'm about to finish school. I need to get a real job. A professor basically said, hey, there's this great company. And it was Coldwell Banker, which was the predecessor company of CBRE. And they were looking for part-time research analysts. And so I went and applied for a job and I was hired as a part-time commercial research analyst. I've been with the firm ever since. So it's, it's 40, wow. you know, 40 plus years. I was in San Francisco, Chicago. And then um, I went at the tender age of 29, because I'd gone through a training program right out of school. I was selected and became the market leader for CBRE in Cleveland. And I was at the tender age of 29 years old. So I was the youngest market leader in the United States. Can you explain to our listeners what it means to be a market leader? Basically, the market leader is the managing broker. So, you know, in 1987, when I showed up, it was a brokerage company. And so I had, you know, let's say 15 salespeople and we were a startup. And now all of a sudden I'm running and I'll get to that part of the story. But and just to say then I just stepped away from the market leader position January 1st of 2021. And at that point in time, I went from being the youngest market leader to the longest tenured market leader in the world for CBR. Wow, in the world. That's amazing. Well, and we had grown when I first started with the company. We were a $200 million US-based brokerage company. Now we're a Fortune 150 global services company with over 100,000 employees. And my operation in Cleveland, get, getting to, you know, I'm the managing broker. And so I'm responsible for all of our business lines and activities here, primarily in what we call the agency side. But, you know, I have 500 plus employees in Northeast Ohio, $80 million in revenue, and brokerage is probably less than half of it. So we do facilities management, project management, lease administration. We did over a thousand transactions on every continent last year, but Africa. And so we represent, you know, major owners of real estate and major corporations of real estate, probably more than 50, two thirds of the Fortune 500 that we do transaction work, facilities work, lease administration, whatever. So we're a diversified services company. And it's been a great journey. But my roots and background are in brokerage. That's a phenomenal story. And what a phenomenal perspective of the real estate market and industry, not just in Cleveland, but a global perspective, which is phenomenal. I mean, you certainly bring that to your work with the commercial committee and the work that you have done in concert with our global committee at Ohio Realtors. So this is wonderful, wonderful stuff. So in addition to your background, we wanted to talk with you specifically about some recent updates to the commercial broker lien law. 
that were passed and enacted last General Assembly. And it's my understanding that you have been working on this project with the association for a very long time, not just in its most recent changes, but all the way back to where we even got started here in Ohio. So if you could, you know, some of our listeners are practitioners, some are not, maybe explain what the commercial broker lien law is, give us a good history, and then talk about why these recent changes were so important. Absolutely. I'm thrilled to be able to do it. And, you know, in my opinion, I mean, this is just one of the real value propositions of Ohio Realtors is our legislative commitment. And we're able to really make a difference. And, you know, the commercial lien law is one that is near and dear to me because I was involved at the beginning. And some of my in-house attorneys at CBRE, we actually helped and worked with Ohio Realtors and helped draft some of the legislation that then went through the legislative committee and the like. But let me give you a context because this change that just happened in December and then the law went into effect just, you know, in January, this is the second time that we've actually tweaked the law. But we go back 20 years when we put the law in place. And let me give you a little context, especially for our residential practitioners as to why this is important. You know, because in a typical sales transaction, Collecting the brokerage fee, it's seldom a problem because most sale transactions, whether it's residential or commercial, typically are escrowed closes. And the commission is it's in writing and it's identified as one of the the costs as you're doing the escrow and you close the transaction. And, you know, same in residential and in commercial. However, probably half or more of the transactions of a commercial brokerage firm end up being leases. And that's really where we've had the problem. Because when you have a lease transaction, and you know these are significant transactions, they're complex, but they typically don't involve a formal closing. So even if you have a written commission agreement, if you end up having an issue with collecting it from the owner, you have to litigate. So you've got to file a lawsuit that is time consuming, expensive and unpredictable. You know, what we ended up doing is we really petitioned through Ohio Realtors and then got involved with legislators and said, look, there's a basic inequity here because these lease transactions create significant value in these assets. And, you know, the annual consideration of the lease, you're probably creating eight to 12 times the value of that rent is the value that it increases the property. So it, it's very impactful. And yet you're kind of hanging out for the commission. And we had so many times when people just didn't want to pay us. So we were able to you know, pass this law some 20 years ago. And just by having that law on the books has made it so that we really, it's just much easier to get paid on lease transactions. Kind of set that standard. So people at least knew, hey, something is here. You can't just walk in and do this however you want. This episode of The Real View is brought to you by the Ohio Association of Community Colleges. Ohio's network of community colleges provides accessible training that accommodates the busy lifestyles of aspiring real estate professionals at half the price of a traditional university. With convenient locations in every part of the state, as well as online options, Ohio's community colleges are your smart choice for pre-licensing education. For more details or to start the journey to a real estate career, visit the education page at ohiorealtors.org and then click on the pre-licensed course locations. So why the update? What was going on? Why did it need to be updated? Well, there was two updates and update number one was maybe a dozen years ago. And what we found then is that we needed to tweak the law a little bit because it was cumbersome the way that we had originally structured it. And you had to make all these notices. It just was complicated. And it was almost like you're having to file a lien in anticipation that they're not going to pay us. So we were able to kind of clean that up and great, everything was fine. Well, and that was, you know, 10, 12 years ago when we did that tweet. Well, then what's happened since then is we basically started encountering another basic inequity 
that existed in the law. And what it related to is that in the original legislation, we had language which said, if the prevailing party, if I'm having to sue under the lien law to collect the money and perfect it, if I'm, I'm incurring legal fees to do that. And basically the way the original law was written is that those legal fees, you may be able to collect them under the lien law. Well, what started happening was there were some owners and some attorneys in Ohio that really became aware of this, you may collect fees. And so what started happening was, especially on smaller commissions in our world, which is, let's say, under $30,000, owners and their attorneys repeatedly took advantage of that may language and basically would just fight us tooth and nail. And so you might spend fifteen, twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars in legal fees to trying to maybe collect thirty. Collect them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so what we ended up doing, and it just was a very minor tweak, is that we changed the word "may." Is that now it's written the prevailing party in enforcing a commercial lien will mm. be able to collect legal fees. So it, it's a huge change for us, and makes a big difference. Yeah, for sure. So it's a small little change in wording, but um, big impact. Talk about what you think the long-term effects of this are going to be and how it's going to change the game. Well, I, I just think that it makes it so that there's just a true acknowledgement of the value that these lease transactions create. And there was three or four situations that we were aware of around the state, and I was involved in one of them, where it's like, wow, they, they did everything they could to make us increase our legal fees, fight us tooth and nail, and they just knew. And, and I ended up in a mediation procedure with one of the judges because as part of the process, they put us into mediation. And I'm a trained mediator. And I had some face time with the judge and that judge really said, you know, regarding this legal fee thing, it's written May and that's how I look at it. And so I'm not in favor of it. And so we ended up compromising more than half of our fee away just to reduce legal fees. So this will make that go away and the judiciary will have to respect the way it's written. Yeah, which is great. I mean, that's great. What a wonderful change. And I think we, like you said before the podcast, have to give some credit definitely to Beth Wanless, our director of government affairs. She worked very, very hard to get that through and make sure that it was included before the General Assembly ended last year. So kudos to her and kudos to you for helping with that process. So that's a phenomenal story. I do want to kind of just pick your brain a little bit more just about the broader commercial market, you know, post COVID, pre COVID, you know, what's it looking like? We had a phenomenal announcement out of the Cleveland area just recently with the innovation district designation. And so while we have you, although I would like to bring you back to talk about some other things um, sometime soon, just curious to hear, you know, your thoughts about the commercial market in Ohio. Well, I, you know, obviously the pandemic has been incredibly disruptive to the commercial market. You know, the residential markets have remained incredibly active throughout this period. And the industrial markets have remained incredibly active because the pandemic didn't, it accelerated trends that were already in existence as opposed to just changing everything. But the whole move to online sales has made the industrial market just go on fire because of logistics and supply chain. So that's been great. But then you look at what's happened in the retail sector. Again, huge change there as you know, the supply chain has gone away from bricks and mortar to more online retail. And yet we're seeing things come back. Food and beverage, incredibly disruptive and, you know, 20 to 25 percent of the restaurants closing may not reopen. But the good news is, is now that the light seems to be at the end of the tunnel related to the vaccine and the like, we're seeing some new concepts and some private equity behind some new restaurant concepts. So I'm confident that 2021 is going to be an active retail market, especially in food and beverage as this comes back. The biggest unknown in commercial real estate, though, relates to the office market. And right. what does this work from home thing mean for the office space? And that's going to play out in 2021 and beyond as firms figure out what their future workplace strategy is all about. So stay tuned. It's an exciting time. Change is never easy to most people. 
And so certain people are just, you know, kind of freaked out and so on and so forth, but others are leaning in and see great opportunity coming out of this market. So stay tuned. It's going to be interesting to see, you know, in the next five to 10 years, what this world looks like and how things are different and the sort of innovation that's going to come out of this, because I, I think it will, you know, I, I don't think people are going to want to stop going out to eat forever or stop, you know, you know, just doing some of the things that, that you mentioned. So I think it's going to be really cool to look back in the next couple of years and see what see where we are from here. I completely agree in that, you know, many of us are social people, whether it's going out to eat or the workplace strategy. You know, in the statistics, my firm's done a lot of research on this. Okay, 20% or more people, they're comfortable working from home. They may not come back. But, you know, then the 80%, you know, there's a group that'll be back completely. (laughs) And then, you know, I'm more of the middle of the road. I I would like to be in the office, you know, three plus days a week when it's convenient and collaborate. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you there. I'm like half and half. I love being at home. It's so much better for me to focus. But Carrie and I are both very social people. And we took this whole work from home personality, you know, test and Carrie and I are both like social. We want to talk. We want to be with people. So definitely maybe not home full time. But, you know, I like the idea of of a hybrid model where we're in a few days and and out. And luckily, I think that's going to be the plan, you know, even when it is safe to be back in five days that we'll still have that flexibility, which I think is really great. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm I'm really excited. Um, You know, people talk about in the office market about the death of co-working space. I couldn't disagree more. And obviously, nationally and globally, we saw this meltdown of WeWork that happened kind of pre-pandemic and early part of it. But that, that's a different issue. I, I'm convinced that, you know, agile workspaces and co-working is going to be part of the mix. And I'm excited that this new view that I've got in this apartment that my wife and I are moving to, there's going to be a co-working space on the first floor. Oh, that's cool. That's really so, cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's so really I'm going to cool. be in the co-working space back in my office and then just remote yeah. out and about. Well, and it's a quality of life issue as well, right? I think a lot of people yeah. have found that, wow, it's really nice to finish work at 445 and then in five minutes be able to start dinner. <laughs> it definitely has given so much flexibility, you know? Yeah. Yeah. There's not that whole, I got to drive home in rush hour traffic and right. waste, you know, 30 minutes, you know, of my day sitting to get home. Yeah. For Allison and I, though, we do deal with loneliness. I think the takeaway from our study, Dave, was that she and I, anytime you need to talk to us, you should do a Zoom because we love to see yeah. people. <laughs> but, you know, you even see states get in Ohio just recently announced, um, I think, $50 million in the budget to recruit people to the state. And part of that is the whole concept of work from anywhere, right? You have some states actually providing cash incentives to get working professionals who can work remotely to come to their state you know, buy a home, invest in the community. And we actually just did a podcast the other day with Alan Lungo from Costa Rica. And he has seen people from the United States rent out their U.S. homes and go down to Costa Rica and purchase an investment property and choose to work from there. So, you know, when there's there's a tragedy and a change, it's hard. But to your point, on the other side are some really great ideas about how to do life and work and where to do it. No, I, I agree. You know, one of my, it's funny you say Costa Rica because one of my sales professionals has been working from Costa Rica for probably a month now. And in talking to him, there is all these, you know, people from all over the country that are down there. And he actually he's he's a food and beverage restaurant guy. And he has met some fascinating people that he's actually going to end up doing business with. What can you say? It's crazy that it's taken a pandemic for for this to become normal for, you know, this work from anywhere idea, you know, living in the world where we have access to technology like we have. It's kind of crazy to think that it's taken a whole shutdown and, you know, you may get sick if you are around your coworkers to to realize that this is a thing and it's, you know, turning out to be better in, in some ways than being in the office. I mean, the opportunities like you just mentioned, you know, would that have ever happened if not for COVID? You know, who knows? Couldn't agree more. And it's our organization, though, because we have all these different services. We like to get people together for what we call serendipitous collaboration, which is just people kind of running into each other and bouncing ideas. And, the you know, the challenge with working remotely in Zoom calls is you've got to kind of work ahead and, oh, I want to get this group of people to share ideas as opposed to just bumping into them on the street or in the office. So 
it's the combination. I think it's going to be tremendous. But I, I completely agree with you. This pandemic has brought some great things, even though there's been a lot of stress and tragedy and, and the like with it. Absolutely. Cool. Well, Dave, this was a great episode. Thank you so much for the work on on this new commercial lean law. And uh, what a huge success. And I'm sure, you know, there will be more to come and, and we will be seeing you again soon. But thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for your work, uh, your hard work on making this happen for commercial realtors across Ohio. I am sure they are appreciative. We are appreciative and we are lucky to have you as a part of our team. So keep up the awesome work. And I am sure we will be uh, speaking with you again soon. Well, thanks, Allison. Thanks, Kerry. Thank you, guys. Thank you for listening to The Real View. That wraps up today's episode. You can keep up with the latest on the podcast at ohiorealtors.org slash The Real View and on Apple or Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Have questions, comments, or suggestions? We want to hear from you. Email us at podcast at ohiorealtors.org. We'll see you next time. This has been a Humble Pod production. Stay humble.